And now it's time for Madison's Mad Facts with your host, Madison Standish. Hey everybody, it's Madison. Welcome to another Madison on the Air bonus feature of Madison's Mad Facts, where we look at the way things were in real life back during these old-timey radio shows. Our latest episode is from the show Defense Attorney, centered around the female lawyer, Martha Ellis Bryant. Listen to the episode first. I will speak now, and you will forever deal with spoilers. I'm serious. I'm about to reveal the ending. All right. Now it's all on you. In our episode, two spoiled rich brothers kill their other brother, frame their father for his death, and then kill their father, all to get their hands on the inheritance. Children killing for the inheritance is a plot used in a lot of murder mysteries. So I wanted to do some digging to find out how often this happens in real life. Children killing their parents. To help me out, we're doing a fabulous crossover with the true crime and paranormal podcast, Misty Mysteries. Everyone say hello to Keely. Hey, Keely. Sup? Hi, Madison. Thank you for having me on. I'm so excited to have this discussion with you today. Well, we're super stoked to have you here with us. So let's get started. Okay, the act of killing the father is patricide, the mother, matricide, and they both fall under the umbrella term of parricide, which is defined as a child killing their parent or close family relative. Historically, for literally centuries around the globe, instances of parricide were committed within monarchies or wealthy families, a child committing parricide for title, power, and money. If you want more of that, go read Shakespeare or watch Game of Thrones. We're going to bring the study of parricide into modern day and talk about how current criminologists study this form of murder today. Keely, start us off with the three perceived motives of modern day parricide. These are very generalized categories, any of which could be expanded and discussed at length. But for our purposes, we'll do a rough overview. The first motive incorporates children suffering from severe mental illness. Second, those children who kill to end severe and ongoing physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. And the third category is the kind mentioned in your episode of Defense Attorney. It involves children who, lacking empathy, kill their parents for selfish reasons to remove them as an obstacle from something they want, like money or freedom. Okay, case study number one. An example of parricide committed due to mental illness. This is from the article Forensic Science, Medicine, and Pathology, which will be cited in its entirety at the end of this episode. Go for it, Keely. This case of parricide was carried out by a son against his father. The 83-year-old father was found in the dining room of his apartment. He was murdered by his 45-year-old son who lived with him. It is classified as a case of overkill by the amount of fatal wounds found on the victim, as well as Cagra syndrome. Cagra syndrome is characterized by a delusional belief that a person has been replaced by an imposture. The son had been unemployed for the 19 years leading up to the murder. At that time, he undergone his first psychiatric admission due to acute delusions. Although no family of history of psychiatric disorders were found, the son had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Case notes at the time indicated he had a good treatment adherence. He was readmitted a second time, 12 years before the murder, and officially diagnosed with depression and personality disorder. Then, a day before the murder, the father made a request for a medical examination citing treatment of non-adherence. And after the homicide, the forensic psychiatrist expert concluding that the son had schizoaffective disorder with acute paranoid delusion. So what was the ruling then on this case? Could the son be held accountable? The son was charged with the homicide on the grounds he refused treatment the day before the murder. Because there was evidence that the father had requested an appointment at an outpatient service of the public department of mental health, it was concluded that the son was criminally irresponsible. It was determined that by refusing his treatment adherence, he had an acute delusion that motivated uncontrollable homicide behaviors. So he was held accountable. In the interview after the murder, the son claimed his father had been replaced by an imposture that threatened both his life and his father's life. And he had also attacked his father. He said he perceived him as an inanimate object, like a sack of potatoes. And the son fit an identified pattern for parricide due to mental illness, right? 
Yeah, the son was a middle-aged, unmarried, unemployed man living with his father who had a long history of psychiatric disorders and diagnoses. Okay, that covers mental illness. What about children who kill to put a stop to abuse? That doesn't fall under the same category as mental illness? Right. In many of these cases, the parasite are committed by juveniles, most often teenagers. The legal approach is usually self-defense, described by some psychiatrists as a sane reaction to an insane environment, but none of these parasites are cut and dry. Each must be dissected on a case-by-case basis. So give us a good example of this type of parasite. This case involved a Russian Jewish immigrant family. The father was killed by his 15-year-old son after a lifetime of abuse. The father moved them around, usually running his own restaurant wherever they would settle down for the moment. Unfortunately, the constant moving allowed his children to slip through the cracks with child protective services. There were multiple reports by teachers, the mother, and the boy himself a physical torture that he endured at the hands of his father. One such time when authorities confronted the father of the abuse, he told them, this is my child and I'm going to bring him up the way I want. He went home and broke his son's hand that night to deter any further official involvement. Three years prior to the murder, the boy's mom had left the family fearing for her own life at the abuse of her husband. After that, when the boy was pulled out of school at 14 to work for his father, the boy believed no one was going to help him, so he had to help himself. Enlisting the aid of the dishwasher at the restaurant, who had witnessed a great deal of the abuse, a murder plot was planned and ultimately carried out. So how does the legal system handle a parasite that stems from a lifetime of child abuse? In this particular case, and ones like it, the argument is that the child is so isolated and under-socialized that he or she doesn't have the capability to simply leave an abusive environment. Is a child who is friendless, withdrawn, and lacking in self-confidence. They have no classic characteristics of juvenile delinquencies. Their worst offense may be shoplifting or truancy. They deny and cover up their resentments and hostilities until they reach a breaking point. And since they've grown up seeing their parents using violence as a solution, they too act on it. In the case of this 15-year-old teen, he was given 15 years probation. But even in that case, without the psychiatric help, the teen may continue the cycle of violence with his own future children. That's all kinds of messed up on every level. Okay, let's move on to the completely opposite type of child who kills his parents. One who does it out of selfishness with no emotion or remorse, like in our episode of Defense Attorney. Well, the third category of parasite is described as done by children looking to remove their parents as an obstacle for their own benefit. It is also the least common of the type of parasite. As mentioned earlier, historically, children killing for money and power occurred often enough that even ancient Roman laws gave very clear punishment for the crime. But in modern day, it's not found to occur as frequently. So what modern day case do you have of this type of parasite? In rural Oklahoma, a 19-year-old college student fatally shot both of his parents and his younger sister in order to inherit their estate to pay off mounting debts. The boy was described as a very lavish spender who would buy expensive items on a whim. The year prior, his father had turned him into the police for running up a $5,000 debt on his grandmother's credit card. He was on probation and attending Shoppers Anonymous meetings, but with little effect. At the time of his family's murder, he was in extreme debt to a loan shark. He still continued spending money at an alarming rate. His father owned a small circulation newspaper at the time of his death. Having sold and profited from selling a larger newspaper some 15 years before, the boy believed if he killed both of his parents and his younger teenage sister, he would inherit all of the family's assets and be able to solve his financial troubles. He performed the murders on a Friday, then drove with a friend to Dallas and paid for a luxury hotel for both of them for the weekend. When questioned after the boy's arrest, the friend said he had no indication on that trip that anything had happened. He was happy, joking, and having a great time 
time, all the while knowing his family lay dead in their home. Their bodies wouldn't be discovered until the following Monday when the housekeeper came in for work. Okay, that's some cold stuff right there. In cases like this one, where it's clear the homicide was committed with no remorse, the defense will push for the strongest penalty under the law in that state. For this particular case, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He had been considered for the death penalty, but his grandfather didn't want the boy to go through years of appeals and possibly have his conviction for the murders overturned. The grandfather wanted the punishment to stick, and life in prison starting at the age of 19 was what he felt was justice for his family. But if his family is dead, does he actually still inherit the estate? No, the United States has what is called the Slayer Rule, where a person is prohibited from inheriting property from a person they murdered. This also covers a wide range of murders, not just parricide. Well, all right, Keely. Thank you so much for hanging out with us and giving us a bit of background on parricide. Thank you for having me on to talk about this topic, Madison. Misty Mysteries is widely available. You can find Keely on all your favorite podcasting platforms, including Good Pods, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and I bet wherever you're listening to this right now. Thank you all for listening to our little bonus feature crossover of Madison's Mad Facts, and get ready for new episodes of Madison on the Air to premiere the first of every month. We would like to cite Trotta S., Mandarelli G., Ferrarelli D., et al., Patricide and Overkill, a review of the literature and case report of a murder with Cabral Delusion, Forensic Psi Med Pathol, 17, 271 through 278, 2021, as well as the Los Angeles Times article, Fatal Means for Children to End Abuse, Parasite, Cases of Vote, Conflict, and Sympathy, Need for Punishment, by Lois Timnick, August 31st, 1986. Names have been left out of these case studies to protect all those involved.